Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gil at epen.info. My guest today is Professor James McGaw, who is Emeritus Professor of Neurobiology and Behavior at University of California, Irvine. He is also Fellow of the Center for the Neurobiology of Learning and Memory. Welcome, Jim. Hello there. Uh, I want to start with uh, one of your older papers uh, entitled Making Lasting Memories, Remembering the Significant, in which you say, although forgetting is the common fate of most of our experiences, much evidence indicates that emotional arousal enhances the storage of memories, thus serving to create selectively lasting memories of our more important experiences. Uh, You say that neurobiological systems mediating emotional arousal and memory are very closely linked. Uh, Before we get into it, Jim, um, I wondered if you could sort of uh, define memory a little bit and, um, you know, have our understanding of memory change over time? Do we have a better understanding of what we mean by memory now? All right. Uh, Memory is something that we infer from individuals and from animals. All we ever see is behavior. And on the basis of behavior, we make inferences that that a prior experience produced some kind of a change in, in the, in this case, the brain of the animal or the human, such that they can behave differently. And we make inferences that there are memory processes underlying the change in behavior. Now, the, the function of memory is to, to allow us to behave. If we didn't have memory, we would be, be just like vegetables. Uh, we're right. able to have an experience, remember that experience, and change or, or repeat our behavior on the basis of that experience in order to survive. So memory is a, a fundamental set of abilities that aid in our survival. Right, right. You know, so that's a very interesting way to think about it. So uh, clearly for animals, we have to infer memory through their behavior. But in the case of humans, uh, couldn't we actually say um, what we mean by memory? I mean, we have a potentially a, a, a larger set of data that we can use to define memory, right? Oh, a larger set, set of data, but it, it's, the inference is the same. Uh, hmm. uh, if I... Uh, watch you play tennis, for example, uh, I can make inferences about your ability to to uh, change your behavior on the basis of experience, and that's all I have. In the case of, of yourself, uh, I presume that you learn to speak language. Now, if I observed you when you were a child, I could see the process of your acquiring the language. But all of the things that we do are based on experiences that then cause us to change our behavior in response to the experience. And, and as scientists, what we try to do is to figure out what happens in the brain 
that enables that change in behavior or the repeat of behavior, which is based on the experience. And it's the same inferential process that we use when talking about uh, human behavior as when we're talking about uh, animal behavior. Hmm. So, so both tactically, James, so suppose I say, um, you know, I saw X, right? Um, so, so I'm, you know, talking about very short term memory. I saw X last Wednesday on street Y. Uh, you know, I, I'm sort of articulating uh, something from from the past. Uh, that I guess at that point, uh, would you say I am making an inference or I am actually uh, memor uh, memorizing something? No, you're, you're using information. Uh, I, would use, I would have to make the inference that that's based on memory. And of course it is because there isn't any other way to explain your ability to do that. But you're just using the information that you acquired at a previous time in order to affect your behavior at this time. And that's, that's what memory does. It allows us to use experiences in order to, to change our behavior to make it appropriate for the moment. Yeah, so, I mean, this has a lot of implications for judicial proceedings, witnesses. So, so when, when people um, say they have seen somebody or they have something in the memory, um, you know, how, 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 do you, how do you define that? So, you know, in a very mechanistic way, um, in a computer, we can store something and we can retrieve it. Now, that is not really what's happening in the brain, is it? Well, uh, not in the same way. But the, we do have processes that are evolved in, in, in the storage of information and then in the accessing of that information. But from what you said, uh, I wouldn't necessarily take what you said to be true. I'd, I'd have to study to see what were the circumstances under which the information was available to you and then study you at a later time to see how your behavior changed as a consequence of that. I'm not gonna take your word for it. Uh. <laughs> right, right. Um, but presumably though, the process you're going through to analyze the information, the information that I have provided is, is also something that you have learned, right? So it is sort of a chicken and egg problem <laughs> in some ways. Well, uh, it, learning is, is a, a very natural sort of thing. You don't, you don't, you don't yeah. have to learn. Um, uh, when I say two plus two is four, you have already learned uh, the language that's involved in order to understand that. But uh, there's always learning that is occurring. Learn, learning is occurring all the time, all the time. Uh, our brains yeah. are set up just to acquire the information so we can hold it in order to, uh, to behave. Uh, we had to do that, for example, in this conversation. I, had, I have to listen to you and you have to listen to me. And you are remembering what I said. I'm remembering what you said in order to engage in conversation. That's going on all the time. Right. And in a very short term um, situation like that, most of that information is discarded, right? So th there is a difference between sort of long term memory and short term memory, right? Yes, uh, they're probably based on different processes. We don't know the details. But um, if, if I say to you, um, uh, 947263, you can repeat that immediately. You have a memory system that allows that to happen. Tomorrow, you would remember that you and I discussed some numbers, and that would be it. <laughs> you wouldn't, that, that would not need a lasting uh, memory, just that kind of experience. But many experiences can be transformed into lasting memory, either by a sustained repetition or by emotional arousal, which will generate a strong memory 
of even some what otherwise in, insignificant experiences. So we have two ways of making uh, changing a very short memory into a lasting memory. Okay, so that's part of the the, the paper. And so, so is emotional arousal, as you say, is that a necessary requirement for lasting memory? No, um, you can uh, you can rehearse things and create lasting memory. Just repeat something over and over again, or experience something again and again, and a memory will be formed, and the memory will be a lasting memory. And that's what we do a lot of in our daily lives, where we experience the same kinds of things on a regular basis. However, a, a single event can be turned into, experience can be turned into a lasting memory if there is emotional arousal at the time, and the emotional arousal will produce changes in the body and in the brain then, which will create the lasting memory. And that's what I have studied. Hmm. Okay. And so, so, so what's the circuitry that is involved there, Jim? Um, could you go into, so, so, so what happens in the presence of an emotional arousal and, and you know, some, some memory that gets, that, that gets stored in a very lasting fashion that you can always recollect? Uh, there's something happening in the brain in the presence of an emotion, yes. right? Uh, so what is mechanistically all what right. happens? So you have an exciting experiences of some kind. You have an automobile accident or you get injured or somebody gives you an ice cream cone when you didn't expect it. It can be very positive. It can be very unpleasant. There is a surge, a release of adrenaline into the body. That adrenaline then activates the brain, which causes a release of neurotransmitters in the brain. And a, a major one which is involved is noradrenaline or norepinephrine. When that is released, it activates a very specific region of the brain called the amygdala, which is an, an almond shaped structure. We have two of them, one on either side in the brain. When that region gets activated, it sends its projections to a wide array of um, brain regions, and it says, in effect, store the experience you've just had, it's important. That's what the amygdala does. It sends out the instructions, and so whatever happens then will be stored more strongly because of the activation of the amygdala to turn on the processing in these different regions of the brain that are designed to process different kinds of information. Now, the amygdala doesn't know anything. It just gets turned on. It's an activator. It's a modifier. It's an arousal system. But it's there designed so that when it's activated, when memories are being processed in other places, it, the memories are, for storage are processed much more strongly through the activation of this system. Hmm. So I, I'm thinking, Jim, this, this would have had some selection advantages. I would imagine early humans wanted to store uh, either very, very present or very unpleasant Absolute. memories, the, right? The latter one has uh, potentially big survival. Absolutely. Uh, the uh, Neanderthal shows up at a stream and looks up and there's a cyber tooth, a, a saber tooth tiger across from it in the stream. It's a good thing to remember that and not go back to that particular region of this of the stream. So this is a system which is designed to selectively, selectively make strong memories of important experiences. And it goes on, it goes on all the time. It is online. It's happening right now as you and I talk. If something, um, uh, if you uh, fell right now, if you fell and you uh, uh, hurt your arm, uh, that would uh, cause a very strong arousal. And you would remember, oh, on this day when we were discussing, I fell and I hurt my arm. And you'll remember that for a long period of time. So this is an online process. And, and it, it serves a very adaptive function of making important experiences turned into lasting memories. Hmm. And, um, and obviously, uh, this is also important Otherwise, we will start memorizing a lot of unimportant information, even though there may not be a capacity problem. 
there might still be sort of an you know uh, efficiency well, problem if you start from that's a very everything. good point it's a very good point that this is selective and it's not going to jam up the system it says remember this remember this remember this all of the important things uh, are get, get selected uh, for that so it's a highly adaptive and and highly selective system that is uh, uh, they're uh, a responsive in us and in animals all the time, highly adaptive. Yeah. So the instruction set running in the amygdala is basically making this differentiation or sort of a prioritization. Yes. Um, precisely. Yeah. Precisely. It's prior prioritizing experiences for memory. Right, right. And so uh, I remember reading long time ago, Jim, um, <laughs> talking about memory. I don't have very good memory of it, but uh, there are there are some diseases where people are unable to forget anything that they tend to store uh, all information. And, and that that becomes a big issue um, for that person. Is there, is there such a thing? Well, uh... In, in one sense, there is uh, for a, a very small, highly specialized group of individuals who have what's called eidetic imagery, imagery um, in which they can have an experience and then remember that experience in, in great detail. There's a, 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 an autistic man in, in uh, London, for example, who, who has flown over cities and then the next day can draw the rooftops of the cities in a high degree of accuracy. But this is highly unusual. Then there is a larger group of people uh, in the United States. We have perhaps 100, maybe 150 individuals who have what I have called highly superior autobiographical memory. Uh, these individuals are able to remember uh, the, the activities that they did engage in for most of the days of their lives with a high degree of reliability. Now, they don't have detailed memory of every event of every, every day, but they have a general memory. On this day, I went shopping with my mother, I have a fight with my boyfriend, or I went for a drive. The kind of memory that you and I have of yesterday, but they have that for most of the days of their lives. And uh, that, that constitutes a a subgroup of people in our world who have that specialized kinds of memory, which does not seem to follow the rules that we've just talked about, uh, in which we have selective memory for important things. They have strong memories of all kinds of experiences. Uh, so do, do they also remember the timestamp? Like, would they say, you know, last June 5th, 6 p.m., I, yes. I did this? Yes. So they, that time they, they have well. a, okay. a highly uh, detailed representation of the days of their life. They know the days of the week on when, th when things happen. And we've tested these individuals extensively uh, to discover that what they say is actually true. In some cases, they kept diaries so we could check the diaries. Um, and in other cases, we use other techniques uh, for finding out. So these individuals are unlike us and that they are able to remember uh, the, the days of their lives in uh, much more detail and for a much longer period of time than you and I can. Uh, the interesting thing is that it doesn't appear to have any particular adaptive value for them. Uh, and I find that quite interesting as well. Yeah, so, so so you mentioned autism um, and, and subset there, fo photographic, you know, sort of memory that they can have very detailed memory of mm -hmm. something. Uh, but this subset uh, who is able to memorize um, events for a long period of time in a timestamp fashion, is there any, any known mental diseases that are correlated with that condition, or is that considered to be a condition in Are uh, you talking about the highly superior autobiographical memory? And yes. Yeah, well, yeah, we have yeah. done uh, uh, several studies uh, with, my, with my colleagues. Uh, one was a, a, just a structural an analysis of the brain using MRI, and we identified a couple of regions that appeared to be different 
in, uh, in size or in shape and in individuals who have this highly superior autobiographical memory, but nothing that was particularly instructive. It was just descriptive and it, it didn't tell us anything. Uh, in collaboration with a group in Italy, we also uh, have done studies looking at the, at the activation of brains uh, of these subjects while they are remembering uh, using functional uh, uh, imaging and have discovered that the, their brains act differently when they are recalling from the way that your and my brain works. So the, the big clue is that there is that, that uh, these people have an a, ability and a style of remembering which is different from us. And they, the, the difference may lie then not in what they have learned but in how their brains to access information that they have learned. So it looks as though they have a different retrieval, different memory retrieval system. And I find that quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. And so these memories, uh, they have to be involved in it, right? What I'm thinking is that suppose they, they read a, you know, sort of a history book or something, uh, and can they actually recollect history in, in, no. in that fashion, or is no, this it doesn't yeah, work it's different? That way. Uh, it doesn't appear to help them in education. Um, uh, it, 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 there's, there's no evidence that the memory system works in that way. It works only to have them help recall their daily activities. Um, we, we've tested them on all kinds of memory tests to see if they're better in standard memorizing in the laboratory, and they are not. So this is just something about the way they access their daily lives, how, how they store their daily lives, and how they access the information from those daily lives, uh, the, the, the retrieval, retrieval system that they have to do that. It's, it's highly interesting. And why it is that it does not carry over to ordinary school learning, which it does not that, that's a mystery. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's really fascinating. You know, uh, one could speculate that everybody has this information, but the retrieval system is not not able to retrieve it uh, in the sense that um, the you know the the memory system do not consider this to be important enough to be yeah. lasting uh, in a in a typical person. Uh, although, you know, just like a computer, when we stored something and then deleted it, it is still there, uh, right? We just yes. can't retrieve it. Uh, is it a similar situation? We don't know how much information you have. Uh, you don't know how much yeah. information you have. Um, it, it's very interesting that the way that things will pop into our heads from the distant past. You may hear just a, a brief tune, for example, and all of a sudden you can remember a complete tune of something that you learned decades ago. Um, it, it'll pop into your head and you say, where did that come from? That was stored there. You haven't used it in a long time and it comes up. We all know uh, about what's called the tip of the tongue memory. Uh, we all experience it in which we try to remember something and we can't remember it. And then about 20 minutes later, it yeah. pops into our heads. Well, now, what was that all about? That says that we, in some way, gave instructions to our brain to search for information that was there, and the brain went to work, and 20 minutes later, it found it and popped it up again. So that raises the question, uh, how much information do we have in our brains, and to what extent is our, our, our forgetting, what we call normal forgetting, uh, uh, it is simply an indication that over time our retrieval system has a more difficult time locating information that is really there in the brain. So maybe we've stored an enormous amount of information in the brain and the, the problem is retrieving that information. Right, right. And so, so you mentioned uh, some of the stress hormones uh, when you have yes. emotional arousal uh, norepinephrine and uh, corticosterone. And so, so are there experiments that shows, uh, let me ask it differently, can we actually inject somebody with these hormones uh, and see if there is, there is oh, an yes. impact? Oh, uh, yes. In our experience, 
experiments in our experiments that yeah. what we do that's what, what we do uh, we train animals and we administer uh, in many experiments ad administered epinephrine or, or cortisol uh, immediately after training while memories are in the process of becoming consolidated and we could enhance memory we could also do that by uh, injecting the uh, substances directly into the amygdala so we could put noradrenaline directly into the amygdala, amygdala after training and find enhanced memory at a later time. So we've done many experiments uh, in which we have administered the stress hormones and the substances activated by stress hormones, given them to animals and to humans and to human subjects and shown that we could enhance memory uh, if we administer these substances shortly after learning and then test them uh, subjects a day or a week later. Mm. Yeah, is there a practical product out there that that uh, allows uh, humans to enhance no. memory? It, 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 it can't work that way. Uh, if you just think about what we've said, yeah. it's it's timing. It's timing. So if you have an experience, mm. and the brain has to be activated to store that particular experience, so there is a a, um, a an increase for a short period of time that, that that allows for that to happen it's not a sustained level of um, epinephrine or cortisol it's a pulse of it so you have experience and there has to be a selective increase at that particular time in order to turn on the amygdala to say store this not something store this right and so it, it wouldn't work to have a higher a high level of epinephrine or cortisol because it wouldn't give you the selectivity that's needed. Hmm. So, so I, I'm just uh, thinking, Jim. So the the rat experiments um, can we actually cycle cycle the stress hormones and is there any uh, what I'm asking is there any sort of reprogrammability uh, of the memory. Um, so presumably, if you give the stress hormones uh, to a rat, uh, the rat will then have a higher level of memory for an event. Uh, I'm just wondering if there is some other way to reprogram that or, or erase that oh, memory. Uh, yes, the, the erasing of the memory uh, was um, first really experimentally done in 1949. Uh, by a man named Duncan at Northwestern University using electroshock stimulation. Um, uh, you may know, or the listeners may know, that um, electroshock was introduced in the 1930s as a treatment for various kinds of mental disorders, uh, particularly depression. And in the course of that, it was discovered yeah. that people who were given electroshock had memory problems. And so this scientist uh, did an experiment in which he trained rats on a simple task and gave an electroshock either immediately after they received training or at some period of time afterwards up to an hour and discovered that he could prevent the memory from being formed if the electroshock was given immediately afterwards but not if it was given an hour later. So this was termed an interference with the fixation or the consolidation of the memory. So that, that can be, uh, the erasure can be done if it is done very quickly after an experience. But if a time passes, an hour or two hours or several, then the memory is fixed and it can't be modified. It was those very experiments that, that uh, gave me the idea of giving adrenaline immediately after training to see if I could enhance memory rather than impair it. And so we have the influences on consolidation that kind of go either way, either enhancing or impairing if the treatment is given shortly after the particular experience in question. Right, right. Uh, but we cannot, we cannot chemically erase it, like you say, once it's That's set, right. it's sort once of it's set. set. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 This is great, Jim. Uh, we'll take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, we talk more about uh, consolidating right. memories. Thank you. Okay. Talk to you soon. Thanks.
This is a scientific sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com. So we are back. Uh, Jim, we are talking about memories, uh, how uh, lasting memories are formed, uh, the role played by uh, stress hormones, uh, perhaps the amygdala, uh, stress hormones in the amygdala making a significant contribution to uh, making memories more lasting. Um, and more generally, uh, you call it consolidating memories. So you have a paper in 2015. You say our own experiences as well as the findings of many studies suggest that emotionally arousing experiences can create lasting memories. Uh, and this uh, autobiographical article, you say, provides a brief summary of the author's research investigating neurobiological systems responsible for the influence of emotional arousal on the consolidation of lasting memories. So one thing I was thinking about, Jim, um, so, uh, you know, uh, when, when something happens, if, if it is emotionally charging, uh, then there will be stress-related hormones in the body and that uh, gets into higher levels of, higher levels of lasting memories. Uh, but again, going to the rat experiments that you have run, uh, suppose you can actually sort of impede uh, the, the stress hormone production that you can actually uh, show, I would imagine, those are not lasting, the memories, I mean. Uh, you mean, can we block the formation? Yeah, b- block uh, or block the effects, I would say, of the, oh, yes. of the hormones. Yeah. Uh, in, in the rat experiments, we could uh, have animals have a very highly arousing experience and yet have no memory of it just by blocking the activation of adrenaline and noradrenaline uh, in the brain or by deactivating the amygdala. So the animals can turn a arousing experience into a weak, unimportant one that is not remembered. So we can do that experimentally, and we've done that in many, many experiments, yes. Right, right. Yeah, so I'm thinking about uh, PTSD. Yes. Uh, clearly, you know, humans, um, I, I do, uh, I'm just speculating here. Yeah. Um, once, as you say, when the memory is set, we cannot do a lot about it. Uh, but, but are there applications in PTSD? For humans? Yes, uh, there are lots of Im- implications. I'll just tell you about one experiment which was done by Professor uh, Roger Pittman at Harvard University, uh, who became acquainted with all of the research that we were doing and decided to do the following study. He had nurses t- uh, uh, stationed at the many hospitals throughout um, Boston so that when a somebody came in from an accident or an injury, he ha- they asked them if the patient would be willing to participate in an experiment. Half of them, yeah. half of them were, were given um, a um, adrenaline blocker and half of them were given a control. And then they were tested a couple of months later for signs of post-traumatic stress disorder. And the subjects that had been given the blocker of epinephrine showed fewer signs of, of, uh, of uh, stress, e- emotional stress or PTSD when tested two months later. So the results matched very nicely what we had obtained in laboratory animals with, with rats. The, the subjects they were given, the beta, um, it was a beta blocker, which was blocking the epinephrine, uh, had fewer signs of having had the memory arousing experience when they were tested two days later. Uh, so I think, yes, there are implications of what we have done. Uh, the, the problem is that, that, that this system is very time dependent. So you can't take somebody who has PTSD and say, right. now we're gonna get rid of it. No, it's too late for that. The PTSD has already been developed. Right, right. Yeah, that goes back to what you were saying. Once the memory is set, 
there isn't a lot you can do, uh, but it has some some possibilities. So you know, so for example, in a war theater, um, it, it sort of a, a um, intervention pre uh, intervention in anticipation uh, of of a situation, uh, you could uh, potentially take some sort of a uh, some sort of a beta blocker sure, if, that might yeah. reduce the probability, right? Yeah, if, if, you, if you could anticipate that there's going to be a highly arousing, unpleasant experience, you, you could probably do something to prevent it. But there is a lot of work going on right now uh, using this kind of thinking to, to decrease um, the emotionality that people are experiencing with PTSD. And... and and they, it goes like this. You, you have a person who has PTSD and you uh, do something to uh, recreate the conditions very slightly and then show them that it is safe or to give a, 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 a blocker of epinephrine at that point and teach them now that something that used to be horrible is now safe. Hmm. Okay, okay. And so so that's interesting. So you could you could potentially have after the effect uh, could potentially try to reverse it. Yeah, you could you could now teach the effect to go away using this yeah. principle. Yes, and that, there is a lot of research in many laboratories throughout the world doing that kind of research right at the present time. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I want to touch on another paper you have, a uh, highly superior autobiographical memory. We talked a bit about this already. Uh, you say that the ability to learn and remember is quite obviously essential for survival. Uh, we benefit from experiences by using past experiences to guide our behavior, our memories enable for our future. But despite the critical importance of memory, we forget. Um, and in some sense, uh, forgetting is a necessary condition in, uh, for survival, right? Yes, uh, we don't want to um, <laughs> we don't want to crowd our brains with a lot of useful information, and so we have selectivity. We forget yeah. the unimportant things, and we remember the important things, and that's the way we get through life. And that's why the people with highly superior autobiographical memory are so puzzling, because they remember an awful lot of non-important information an awful lot, and we don't know why that is, and uh, we don't know why their lives are not negatively affected by this, but they're not negatively affected in any, any serious way. It's a big puzzle. Have you seen the same sort of a condition in animals? No, we, we do not see the same condition with animals. It's tough to, tough to really pick up, right? So, uh, I guess, um, so in a, in a rat model, for example, um, will the rat be a better uh, solver of um, uh, what you call it? <laughs> you, you put the rat in some kind of a maze, right? So will the rat be a better solver of the maze if uh, it is able to uh, remember uh, things in this fashion? Well, we, we don't know. We don't know uh, how to find out whether a rat experiences uh, every day of his life because they don't have important experiences. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'd have to study them in the wild, and if we don't. We study them in a laboratory. In a laboratory, every day they're in a cage, in a white room, uh, in a small cage, and they get food and water. So they don't have a lot of experiences that we can call on. You'd have to study these animals in the wild and we don't do that. Right, right. Yeah, so so in conclusion, Jim, um, in this research, in this area, uh, what, what do you think would be the most exciting direction for us to pursue in the next five years? Well, I think the, the most uh, interesting set of questions before us in, in the field of memory uh, have to do with retrieval. That is, it has to do with, with access. Because I am, I'm drawn increasingly to the conclusion that we have a lot of uh, information in the brain 
but may be stored very weakly, but nonetheless, it's there. And for the reasons that we've discussed, the, the uh, tip of the tongue memory and so on. So what are the, what are the, the uh, ways, what are the methods that can be used to understand how memories are stored in such a way that they are accessible for long periods of time and in many cases completely uh, completely intact memories and uh, that's a, a set of problems that uh, are, are are being uh, addressed right now that research on memory retrieval is starting but i think that this is a, a field which needs to be uh, intensively investigated because it'll tell us a lot more about the mystery of the brain, a lot more about the mystery of memory. Yeah, so so, so what's our current understanding, uh, Jim, of how the memory is stored? It's some sort of an electrochemical process, right? Uh, do we know more, um, you know, mechanistically how the memory is stored? In well, the brain? Uh, every day we learn more about changes in the brain that are, are induced by experience. And we presume that these changes then are a basis for memory. That's, that's still a hypothesis, not a declared law uh, as yet. So that uh, when uh, animals have experience or when brains are activated, changes can take place between the, the connections of neurons. So uh, the, the rule is if uh, neurons talk to each other, they change. And the, the little changes in what are called the synapses, the connections between neurons, uh, those are changes are induced by experiences so that there's greater connectivity within the brain. And the basic hypothesis is, is that this kind of connective, connectivity bringing together large numbers of nerve cells uh, that constitute the memory. That's the hypothesis. And research increasingly looks as though that is true. So progress is being made in understanding the fundamental levels at, at the cellular level uh, in the brain and the, and the conditions at the cellular level that induce the changes and maintain them. That, that work is going on. Uh, very successfully, as a matter of fact. Yeah, so so when you say change, you mean sort of a physical yes. change? You can yes, see? a physical change you can see, yes. And so so, so could we actually see, um, so suppose you take two different brains, one has more memories and the other less uh, compared to the first one, um, can we actually uh, predict um, how that the two brains might compare to no, each other? No, because the changes are very small. Uh, you know, we have, we have right. billions, literally billions of, of uh, uh, nerve cells and, uh, I don't know, an estimate of 10,000 connections on every nerve cell. So the number of possible uh, interactions is huge. It's, it's beyond imagination. And so the problem, the problem yeah. of discovering the changes underlying a particular memory, where that's located and how that works, uh, is, is, it's an, almost an unfathomable question when you think about it. You know, if, if I say right now that the, uh, the moon is, is made of blue cheese, that's new information, and that's now stored in your brain, at least temporarily. <laughs> the, main, right. the moon is made of blue cheese. It's in your brain right now. Now, how are we going to go into your brain and find the particular cells that have been altered out of the billions of cells that are there? And it's not going to be just the, uh, the, a, a few cells. There, it's going to be changed in the interconnections among a large number of cells, according to theory. So discovering, locating the physical basis of a memory is going to be an extraordinarily difficult task for the future. Yeah, but but you did mention though, Jim, that there are some structural features that that uh, seem to be different in the autobiographical memory. Uh, but they're course. not they're not sufficiently uh, refined. It's just the regions of the brain are larger, smaller, shape a different shape. It's not at the micro level. We don't don't have evidence okay. at the micro level. Right. Right. 
Yeah, this is uh, this is great, uh, Jay. My uh, this is a very fascinating area. I think the the more we learn about it, the more questions arise <laughs> in That's this right. area, and and um, you know, there's obviously other fields that are also very interested in this, like artificial intelligence and so yes. on. And uh, there isn't a lot of very good understanding of how how the brain accomplishes. Uh, what it does, uh, and memory is a big yes. part of it. So, um, excellent, yeah. Thanks so much, uh, Jim, for spending time with me, and uh, good well, luck. Thank you. It's, 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 uh, I've enjoyed our discussion, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com.